Well, hello everybody and welcome back to the Hilltop Pillbox here in Abbotsford, British Columbia, Canada. And I've decided to bring things down a little bit here. It's been tough slugging with the Global War 36. Lots of uh, decisions, lots of hurry up and wait, lots of... Oh, just a lot of things going on and things that we are not used to in that game at all. Now, I haven't been able to play version 3 before, so I've been making a number of mistakes... Uh, whether strategically or just uh, rule uh, omissions or miscalculations. But I'm learning. I'm learning. But I thought I'd bring things back down to some old familiar territory here. So here we have the anniversary 1941 setup. We've got music from the Pacific going on. So it's all nice and comfortable. And we're going to get going. But I thought I'd give you a little update here as to the channel and things that are going on. We're getting very close to 2,500 subs, and I got to tell you, that was not expected when I started this. When I started, it was uh, Cliffside Bunker was the guy who got me into it, it's a young grasshopper, and he was doing uh, such a great job with uh, tutorials for Global 40 that it helped me understand the game better and inspired me to make my own channel. I thought, you know what, he makes it seem pretty simple, and he enjoys it, and he's doing it with a good heart, just just wanting to help out the community, and I thought, well, shoot, that's something I want to take part in. So, you know, here we are, uh, three years later, and, you know, things are rolling along pretty well. And when we get to 2,500, uh, I will be doing a uh, fairly substantial uh, giveaway. I'm still not sure what that's going to be, but really appreciate all the support. And the thing I'm really appreciating about the community is the way that people really support each other, whether it's through uh, developing new things, whether it's through gifting things, uh, little design things that people do, uh, additions to the game that just help uh, trick them out quite a bit. Uh, and Here's one here from Hell on Wheels off in Cornwall, off in the UK. He made a file that has the Hilltop Pillbox right there on it, right there in British Columbia. And he also made the die rolling chart, the, the battle board here. And you see the colors of dice match my hit dice. And he sent me a little text one day and said, hey, what color are your hit dice? What are, you know, what's the ones, what's the two? And he put that in. So just fabulous you know things that people do for each other in this community really make it worthwhile I, I suspect that if every time people made videos we found ourselves arguing about things and just everybody's being mean and nasty that none of these channels would exist so keep up the good work folks when you see people make mistakes like myself <laughs> you know continue to point them out but when you do them in a constructive way or an informative way that's great I always think of how I teach. You know, sometimes I do have to say, no, that's wrong, to a student. And sometimes I'll just say that, nope, you're wrong. I said, but, that was, a, a, you know, an excellent guess. I can see why you said what you said. And uh, keep putting your hand up, and the student invariably does. So, uh, making mistakes, that's, that's school, right? School is a mistake-making place. I always tell them, you make them in here. This is a good place to make errors. Don't make them out there. Don't make them out there when your job's on the line or when your relationships are on the line. Make them in, make them in high school. Have fun in high school. Find out what your limits are. Find out how, how the world works and uh, you'll, you'll do much better when you get out there. But uh, we're going to have a good giveaway with 2500 Plus I'm going to do, uh, for those of you who don't know what I look like already, I'm going to do a face reveal of sorts. And I say of sorts because... It won't be the typical face reveal, which a lot of people do, but nah, I think you'll enjoy it. It should be fun. And then you can see whence this voice comes from, unless that's redundant, but uh, it'll be fun. I think you'll enjoy it. But without any further ado, we're going to get into 1941. And like I like to say in all of my uh, games here, I like to tell you what the strategy will be in order for the Axis to win and the Allies to counter that. So for the Axis, the Axis are going to focus heavily on the Soviet Union. Now that goes counter to what my typical 
strategy is, where the uh, ally or the Germans will pour a lot of money into subs and take care of the naval presence in the Atlantic, and the Japanese will come over here and they'll take all the money islands and they'll crush the American fleet, and basically the Axis will rule the waves for the first five or six turns until the Allies can get their economies back in the water. And uh, that's, so that might not have to be done. The Allies are not going to be taking it on the chin here in the, in the naval sense. Of course, Germany is still going to use its ships to sink what it can to start, but we will not be building subs. We are going to go after Russia with everything we've got from Japan, from Italy, and from Germany. And we will see if Russia can withstand the onslaught. We know that the, now that we know that, the British are going to have to send as much help as they can right off the get-go. So you're going to see British fighters heading to the Soviet Union. You're going to see the stuff in the Middle East maybe heading up to the Soviet Union. And the Japanese? Well, they're going to have to deal with China a little bit, but most of their efforts going to go up north and try to head across. So, wish us luck with this. And we will see what we see after round one, anniversary 41 setup. Here we go. Well, this is the Hymn to the Fallen on Saving Private Ryan, and these are the Fallen of Round 1. So, pretty typical opening moves, but it's the second round that will likely be a bit different. Alright, let's go over what happened here in the Pacific. The typical thing where the Japanese come in and kill the battleship and kill the destroyer and the transport, and then the Americans retaliate and kill the rest of the Japanese stuff. So, the Pacific opens up a little bit. But the Japanese are the only ones with any sort of naval presence remaining. The Russians, the Soviets, backed out of here knowing that everybody's coming for Moscow. They're retreating. They're going to live to fight another day. Which allowed, of course, the Japanese to land lock and stock and like a bunch of smoking barrels up there in Baratia. And they'll be chasing them across the frozen wastelands of Siberia. Over here the Germans punched in, not without loss, not without loss, they lost a couple or three infantry over here and uh, only took two territories. The Baltics just weren't in the cards this turn to go after them, they had three infantry in there so they uh, decided to just punch straight eastward and Russians bought ten infantry with their 30 bucks and placed eight in in Moscow and two in Karelia hoping that the 6th infantry here will bloody these tanks enough that the remaining forces can take them so it's a good chance Germany won't attack here until their reserves get up here so they did the typical build six men three artillery ready to come over this way. Now I know some people do f uh, four men, four artillery uh, to come on over, save a little bit of money, but I thought we'll spend as much as we can here on this, on our ground forces. Out in the Atlantic, the uh, British destroyer was sunk by the cruiser and sub. The cruiser was then sunk by the British Air Force, which as you can see landed in Karelia. The British came up here, they lost their battleship and transport so they sank their leftover sub and built a cruiser just to bulk up the navy a little bit just in case the Germans thought, you know what the heck, we'll take a poke with a single sub and a fighter and a bomber because otherwise they would just have two destroyers and a cruiser. Now it's two destroyers, two cruisers so I figure that's enough to keep them out of there. The Americans built three transports and six men and brought the guy from central US, which usually goes to the west coast, they brought him over to the east coast. And they're going to put some pressure here. In Africa, the British built a factory, and the Italians decided not to attack this round, but they're loaded up and ready to go for next round, so that factory might not survive. We'll see. They'll be able to plant three things on it, but the Germans might do a bit of a, an attack beforehand to soften them up a little bit. So that might not have been a good build. We'll find out. The other Brits here, they built another factory in India and moved their stuff from India and Transjordan here into Persia to go and 
give some help to the Caucasus. Chinese, of course, get beat up, so they had to retreat and place two guys, and uh, everybody went back to Sakang. That's pretty much it. The Japanese did take down here. This is, and you know this has to happen on round one, right? There's no denying that this has to happen on round one because, of course, the Japanese need the money and they also want to take the money from the British. So that's what they did there. They sank the American stuff here, but they left the Philippines in the hands of the Americans because, of course, as we know, everything's going to Russia, All right? So that's what went on there. And you might be asking, well, why didn't you come down here with this destroyer and just kill this transport? Well, right now, this destroyer is out of range of the Japanese fleet. The only thing that could get it is if they bring their carrier here and launch the planes, which they could. But Japanese losing a plane for a destroyer transport that is not likely not going to get used just seemed like a bit of a waste. I did consider it, though. I considered bringing the destroyer with two infantry but the Japanese would then be able to possibly reply with two infantry from here and a fighter and possibly put this factory under duress. So lots of little things to think about. Knowing of course that everything is headed to Moscow, uh, we'll see if the Allies have the, the chutzpah to stop it. In my mind I think they do uh, because they're going to be able to just nibble away at the outskirts of the Axis power and their economies should start to shrink. Now, we'll see. I have no idea if this is really going to work. I don't know if this has ever been tried. And in the comments below, leave your thoughts when you do this game. What is your goal? Is your goal just Moscow? Is that it? Or do you say, no, you know what we're going to do? We're going to do kind of like Hilltop does, where just try to take control of the Atlantic and the Pacific. Because if you can do that, Russia essentially will get wiped out eventually. Because if you control the Atlantic and the Pacific, you can kind of take your time with this stuff. So that's typically what I do. We'll see if this works out or if it was a disaster from the beginning. Round two coming up. Round two is over. And things are starting to form up a little bit here. See the Americans have decided to put a little bit of money into the Pacific. Not much though. No ground forces or anything, but three destroyers and they've got a little air power in Hawaii. The Japanese did in fact come here and they did sink that destroyer and in fact did lose a fighter. So they put the fighter from French Indochina onto the carrier just to give that extra movement point likely. But the Japanese left all of these islands and brought their stuff to French Indochina as they pushed in on the Chinese. The Chinese are pretty much toast here. They're down to two territories and uh, it's unfortunate because it wasn't even really part of the game plan. Just kind of, yeah, let's subdue them, but it just works so well. They are very, very, very weak in this game and if if Japan chooses to go after them, it's, there's, it's just math, right? It's just math. Especially if Japan decides to build a factory and start cranking out tanks. Up north, the Soviets gave more ground and the Japanese have obliged them by coming forward, blitzing through the Soviet Far East, of course. Japan is making some pretty serious scratch right now here in round two. They actually made pretty good scratch in round one, but continues. India built a lone tank, and they actually put two tanks in Egypt, but it was all for naught. The Italians were able to land, and the Germans did a, an attack and only actually killed one thing for the loss of their tank, two infantry, and artillery. <laughs> uh, only killed one infantry, but the Italians had much better success. Uh, their three bombards all hit, so that really helps. And uh, there you go, that's what's left. So the British did have a pretty good telling of themselves. They, they killed, uh, well, what was it? A bunch of stuff, like four, four infantry, I think. So they did okay, considering how badly they got kind of blown up there. But it's not over, over, over. I mean, the British still have a couple infantry here, and they still have units down here with the possibility of being transported up. So they might actually take a poke back at it. The Italians built five infantry because they thought, shoot, I'm not going to get caught napping by this American fleet. And then the Americans proceeded to build a battleship and a cruiser over here. 
and now they're ready to sortie forth and bombard the crap out of anything that gets in the way. So that should work well for them. On the eastern front, we see that the British have moved things up into the Caucasus to help out, and the Germans actually pulled back a little bit because there is no way they could take on all this strength. And taking the eastern Ukraine, they just put one guy in. The Russians were going to take it back, but then I thought, why? You're just going to put a guy out there who's going to get uh, wiped out again. And the Germans don't have enough to blitz through, so it doesn't, it's not really buying any time, and you're just getting guys out of position. But up north, that's a real story there. The Russians came in with six infantry and two artillery, and uh, they killed all four German infantry, only for the loss of two of their own. And then the British, of course, took the freebie landing in Norway and uh, have a decent fleet there, but three of it is transports. We have two cruisers and two destroyers. So it might happen that the bomber and... Actually, the fighters have nowhere to land now, so it would just be the bomber. So no, we're not going to do that anymore. I just, as I was saying that, I remembered why I had the British take Norway, because now the Luftwaffe is quite hamstrung, unless they want to move up and protect northwestern Europe, which is only worth two and not really worth it. The Germans continue to focus on ground troops, and we'll see if this is telling, because you can see they have quite a bit of stuff marching this way. The Russians have quite a bit of stuff waiting for them. Will it be enough? And the hope here, the hope, uh, for the Axis side is that the stuff up north here will be largely irrelevant. So anything built up in Karelia will be largely irrelevant as the Germans go south. Now if then the Russians, who are me of course, decide to put no money up north, then the Germans might swing north and take that anyway and then come back down south. So you have to be honest, you have to be honest. That's pretty much everything. The Americans did bomb Germany for a grand total of one dollar, yes. And you'll notice that I did not put out the factories and any aircraft guns in any of the capitals because I was feeling just a little bit lazy. Oh, and you may have noticed at the beginning of the turn, pardon me, the beginning of the game that Transjordan had a whole bunch of stuff and there was only the infantry in Egypt. But what I had done was just put stuff on quickly and went, oh, that's in the wrong spot. So I had moved it all over in case you were wondering after the uh, opening video. All right, that is pretty much it. Here comes round three. The Japanese are rolling again with no natural enemies in the area, but we're, we're gonna try to keep them honest. We'll try. We'll see if it's enough. Round three coming. Okay, round three is done and the Americans are pouring a bit more money over here. Battleship, sub, couple of bombers. And so the Japanese will have to slow down their incredible push westward. Lots of stuff going, lots of stuff getting put on the shore here. It's pretty crazy. Pretty crazy what's happening. But it's happening. And the Chinese are down to one territory. So they did not attack anybody because they've got three infantry and a fighter. So they're going to play defense and get crushed this next turn. Down here, the British tried to break out of India into Burma and lost two infantry and scored no hits, so they retreated, built three tanks. As you know, the Italians took Egypt last round and did not sojourn out except to blitz through Transjordan and take that easy dollar and built another five guys in Italy. Over here, we've got the Americans have finally done their Operation Torch. Taking Morocco, Algeria. Not a lot of punch here, though. Not a lot of punch. They've got seven infantry, one artillery. Not sure if that's going to be very effective. The British landed six units in France and killed a total of three Germans and lost all six. So it was a pretty anemic attack. Thought for sure we'd get a few more hits. The one hit came from a cruiser bombard, and the other two hits came from the tank. But every all the infantry and artillery missed. Just hideous rolling. British built a factory up here in Norway. Nothing on it yet, of course. And yeah, that's pretty much it for that. The Eastern Front, still pretty static. There were thoughts of sending some British equipment north here to take Eastern Ukraine, but again, it would just be sacrifice, and this is all Britain really has in the area now. And not sure if we can weaken India much in the next little while. 
Japanese have brought over their air power and rolled some tanks into town, so pretty crazy there. The Russians do have a lot of power and defense, but not much offensive punch at all. They brought everybody back out of Finland into Karelia and uh, took the Baltic states, but it might, well, it'll cost them an infantry likely at some point. The Germans continue to build ground units. Another 13 ground units last turn, in they go. Now I know some of you are screaming at the TV right now, hey, you can only build 10. Playing with our handy dandy house rule that it doesn't matter that number on your home territory. It does matter, the British can only build 3 in Norway, and in Karelia you can only build 2 units. In Coxus you can build 4. But we say that with the capitals you can build all that you want. And so far I haven't had any really big problems with that. Some people say, well, Russia then, they can build like 10 infantry. I said, yep, they can. They can, but that's turtling, and as we know, turtling tends to lead to horrible things. So, we'll see how it works for them. We'll see how it works. Japanese still rolling, as we can see. Germans are bringing lots of stuff forward. This is a big mess now. This could be a problem. And we're going to see what happens on turn four. I think a big push is coming. Will it be enough? Alright, we are through round four, and the very faintly, you can hear the Jurassic Park soundtrack. It will give it a little bit more volume here. This is the, uh, the welcome to Jurassic Park. Well, welcome to the craziness that is this game. So China's gone. China is gone. And uh, all of the Soviet East is gone, all swallowed up by the Japanese. A couple of the money islands are gone, but the Philippines remains in American hands. And I think Japan might have to do something about that, but we'll see. Because India's bulked up quite a bit, didn't try to do an attack this round, figured the Japanese attack is coming. And now that the Japanese have a bomber in range, they figure, well, we'll, uh, we'll hold back. The Italians cleared up the rest of the British here in Anglo-Egypt, Sudan, lost in artillery doing it, but well worth it. The Americans moved over to put some pressure on and sent their fleet back, and they constructed a couple of bombers over here and some men. The bomber did a bombing run on Germany for one dollar. Yeesh. The first round was one dollar, second round was four, this time it's one again. The Italians the Italians had a little bit of scratch here this time, so they built a couple of things in Egypt, a couple of men, and they built a destroyer and a sub, just wanting to have a little bit more punch than the American fleet. But how about the British fleet? It's gone, yes. The German Luftwaffe attacked it with three fighters and a bomber and killed two destroyers, two cruisers, and three transports. Gone, gone, gone. So, yeah, it's... Uh, Back to the drawing board for the British. Fortunately, they do have a factory here and in India where they can funnel some resources into the Soviet Union. As you can see, they are sending things there as we speak. The Germans took eastern Ukraine, and the Russians actually did an attack out into eastern Ukraine. Because as you can see, they've got lots of cannon fodder, right? So I put it into the battle calculator, and they had 34 infantry, two tanks, and actually they had 37 uh, infantry, but three of them were attached to artillery, so we had three artillery, and they had 10 tanks, and they did their attack, and they were at a 57 something, 57 to 58 percent chance of winning. They got three hits <laughs> with about, I guess that's about 40 units, they got three hits. The Germans got 10 hits. So I put it back, and I kind of subtracted the numbers off the battle calculator, and it was down to less than 13% that the Russians would win. So I decided that they'd better back off. They, the Germans still don't have near enough to tackle this, but with the Japanese coming along here, I think together could be a problem. We'll see if that's going to be an issue. I don't think it will be this round. Still got some more build-up to be done. And, uh, but with the British not being able to put any pressure on Western Europe, the Germans might be able to send more forces this way unabated. Time will tell, and will this big Italian fleet play? We'll see. 
Maroon 5 is in the books, and you can see the Americans are coming into the Pacific in earnest. And have actually taken the Caroline and bulked up here in the Philippines. So this is a is a bold move by the Americans to draw out the Japanese. We'll see if it's enough. The Japanese built four more subs. Now again, I said we were going to push everything towards Russia, towards everything towards taking out Moscow. But of course, if you leave your flank undefended, it, you just lose your capital. So of course, I've got to try to do something there. And plus, in order to send everything this way, I've got to come south and protect this. And protect we did. So, took it. It was not easy. <laughs> Lost a bunch of stuff, but we're able to wrest control of India away from the English. Speaking of the English, they are suffering because the Italians, of course, busted through and are now gobbling up Africa. The Americans turned around and took back Morocco, Algeria. The Germans had actually dropped in a couple of troops this turn to take it, and they went back to take it from the Germans and didn't suffer any casualties. The Italians built a couple more and transported a few more to Egypt, fearing an American incursion, and they didn't want to lose their factory the way the British had. Up here, the Japanese actually used a bomber in Calcutta, and it could fly the remaining two up to the Caucasus, which the Germans have taken, as you can see, and the Japanese have moved in with a whole lot of stuff. So the Russians have two large armies on their border, and we know the last attack did not go well for them. So we'll see what they decide to do next turn. The Germans are also making an earnest push northwards, and Karelia is now empty, as the Russians decided to come back and protect Moscow as long as possible, hoping to allow these British tanks, there's six now, and uh, the British have begun rebuilding their fleet to bring over four men. Maybe that'll be enough to bring Karelia back under the Soviet control. But a lot has to happen between now and then. The Soviets are kind of breaking up the German supply lines here by punching into East Poland. They took Eastern Ukraine with a tank this turn to zip through. So a little bit of little bit of housekeeping that needs to be done for the Germans and the Japanese before the main assault can begin, I think. But it looks as though this tall stack is likely bound for Moscow, so the Germans may have to turn and fight it, although the odds are not good for them. They're going to lose a lot of stuff, and it might not go well. But we will see. Sometimes, you know, you can't, you can't make an omelette without breaking a few eggs, as they say. The Americans came over here, dropped a couple guys off, attempted another bombing of Berlin, but got shot down this time. And the Germans attempted a bombing of London, and you can see that their bomber is no longer, so uh, I guess one good turn deserves another. That's it for turn five. Turn six is on the way. Will Moscow remain? All right, now we are free by Gladiator. But no, we're not free. As you can see, Manila has been taken by the Imperial Japanese Army. And uh, they killed some bombers, killed a fighter, killed a couple infantry, and only lost, well, they lost four units, three infantry and one armor. But the Americans responded by coming down and bulking up the Carolines a bit, sank six German, or pardon me, Japanese subs. But the Japanese have brought their fleet from India this way, so... We, it looks like we kind of have parity now in the fleets. They're not exactly equal, but uh, the Japanese do get to build next. And they did build some fleet here this last turn. So what this American push has done is, is it's kept the, Ameri the Japanese from building in Manchuria this round. So if the current Japanese forces aren't enough, there'll be a little bit of a reprieve for Moscow. The Americans also brought in more of the beautiful bombers. See if that has any impact. Over here, things continue to go very, very well. It's tough, tough times right now for the the Russians. Everybody's getting in on it. The Germans, the Japanese, and yes, even the Italians have joined and uh, used their fleet to bring four reinforcements into the Caucasus. 
but not before they scooped up all of Africa now. They've got everything. And they built a couple of tanks here as well. And the Americans, not much they could really do over here. They're kind of chilling. They did bomb Germany, but again, only for $6 this time. Three on each die. And just not going well there. Now, up, up top here, we've got some better news for the Allies. The British have taken back Karelia and are moving eastward hoping to help out Moscow before it falls. But we will see if that is going to be soon enough. The Americans also brought a meager force up to Norway. Now, interestingly enough, all of these transports, we have four transports worth of stuff, which could bring up to six infantry and two tanks into Berlin. And they've got a couple of bombers with air power to possibly help out. Uh, so, the Germans have to be wary of that. The Americans also have just a couple more guys over here that might be able to show up and cause some grief. But, beyond all that, oh, and the Italians built a bomber, because why not? They got the cash, and it's nice to have that little range to reach out and smack something that doesn't belong there. But that is it for our... Wrap up of round six, round seven's coming along. I think this is the round. I think it's now or never for the Axis. Can they do it? Well, look at the Pacific. It certainly is. Nothing left. The big fleets had a couple of massive battles here. And the Americans actually punched uh, way above their weight in this battle here. Japanese hit him with a couple of battleships, a bomber, a couple of fighters, a carrier, uh, some destroyers. It's pretty good. And the Americans actually got down. They had, they were down to three destroyers, one carrier, and a tipped battleship on the last round. And the Japanese had tons of firepower and wiped them out. The Americans got five out of five hits. And so the Japanese were left with two battleships and a cruiser. And then the Americans flew down three bombers and two fighters, dispatched them, but only have one lone bomber left. And put some money into this, but we'll see if it's really, does it mean anything? All right. Well, the Japanese continue to build here. The Italians, as you know, pushed everything up here. They've got Libya back. The Americans are kind of pushed into a corner here. Italians built another bomber, because again, why not? And it looks like they're tooling up to take back Morocco, Algeria. And up here, Moscow remains. But wow, they got some really good dice against the Germans. The Germans ended up retreating after one round of combat, but they did quite a bit of damage. Uh, the Germans did with their tanks and uh, their, their infantry were a little anemic but the, uh, the artillery and the, the supported infantry did okay. But the, uh, the, they, I think they had five or six unsupported infantry and they didn't get any hits with them. But the Russians hit them pretty hard, but then they got hit by the Japanese and the Japanese thumped them pretty good, but they also had to retreat. Now the Japanese had taken Archangel because they wanted to stop the British from coming through and maybe taking Moscow right back. So the Japanese had to divide their forces a little bit. So the British came in with three tanks and the aircraft and dispatched a, two men and an artillery and then they brought in three more tanks. So Russia's actually, I don't know, I think they might hold on here. Knock on wood, we'll see. The Germans can hit them one more time here. Uh, they, they're gonna have a decent amount of tanks, I think 12 tanks. 13 tanks, 13 tanks, and another seven or eight units here. Not enough to kill it, and the Russians will build again, and the Japanese might have enough to take it, but will the British, ah, oh boy, what a mess, eh? What a bloody mess here, so. We'll see what we see here on this round. Not much else going on. Archangel, if, I think I mentioned that, it's been bulked up a little bit. But uh, the Americans spent everything in the Pacific because the Japanese, they've just had their way. They've got half the world under their thumb. So we'll see what happens on the next round. Will this be it for Moscow? And if it is, will the Allies be able to take it back? Let you know right away. 
and you uh, you might be running wondering where the American bombers went. Well, they went right there. <laughs> Tried to bomb Germany, you know, soften them up a little bit more financially, and kaboom. All right, well, I thought I'd treat you to the live battle for Moscow here. We're going to do this in the Indian Ocean. And I figure that if this goes Germany's way and they've got a decent amount of stuff left, then the I think we'll call the game because on Japan's turn, they can swing through with uh, eight tanks and come over here and smash into this with the help of the, some air force as well. And even the Italians can help out a little bit. So we'll just give this a whirl and see what we see. So to start off with, we've got six at one and then six at two. There's no aircraft, so no anti-air happening. So six at one. Uh-oh, looks like it's gonna be that kind of day for the Russians. So six at one, so that's two hits. Get our handy dandy die counter here. So we got two. Now we got six at two. Oh boy. Oh boy. So we're up to six already. We haven't even gotten into our 13 tanks. Not looking good for the Russians. 13 tanks, here we go. So that's three. Four, five, six, right on the bubble so far. And seven for good measure. So we got 13 hits on the Russians. So the bomber's gotta go. That's one, we got six more, that's seven. 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. All right, so they're down to two fighters. So I think that's probably it. Well, who knows, maybe they have an incredible round here. The bomber. Well, look at that. That's a start. So one infantry goes away. And then we've got six twos. So three hits. Oh, we'll go three more infantry. And then we've got six at three. We got three hits. One, two, three. And then two fighters. And just one hit there. All right. Yeah, this is this is over. So we're gonna roll six of our tanks. We need two hits, and we got them. So that's it for Moscow. And one hit in return. So just one more infantry goes away. So this is what's left in Russia. And there is nothing, and I mean nothing, that the British and Americans have that could take that back this round. Considering the Japanese go first, they're just gonna pile in their infantry and artillery. And I'd absolutely waste those tanks on going over here to, to stop everything in Archangel. That would, that's a no brainer. So I think we're going to call it there, folks. That is all said and done. Looking over here, the Italians are quite strong, actually. No natural enemies. they got tons of stuff going on. The Allies, they're not hor doing horribly badly. Uh, they do have Scandinavia with a factory. But over here, the Japanese have got no warships, but they're going to build a ton this round. And they've got like 60 bucks or some insane amount of cash. And they are absolutely going to fill up the map with submarines and air power and enough stuff to protect their transports, although they don't really need transports anymore. They took everything that they really wanted to. You know, Caroline they lost, unfortunately, but it's not worth anything. But with the Italians kind of busting out here and they got a decent navy, my next move with Italy would be to move out into the Atlantic. And now you're threatening Washington, you're threatening London, so they're going to have to pull back. Meanwhile, all this stuff's going to get mopped up pretty simply. So that's pretty much it, folks. So the go for Russia, all everybody goes, seems to work pretty well. Now, I played this game, obviously, against myself, and I did have to take a couple of detours. You know, I didn't send these tanks straight into Moscow. They came down and gobbled up this territory. But the general consensus amongst the three 
leaders was to go after Moscow to the best of our ability and that they have done. And it seems to have worked. The Japanese, yep, built some subs and came down here and had their fun. But they left the Philippines alone for the longest time, only took the money islands, and only had designs on India when it looked as though India could become a real thorn in the side, right? Be uh, going after our flank. And you gotta protect your flanks. Imagine if I hadn't taken this and Britain's popping three tanks a turn down here. Japan's gonna have to spend a ton of money just to hold on to China. And what's the point of that when you can just come and squash this? So let me know what you would have done maybe a bit differently in the comments. And, and uh, I'd love to hear your overall strategies for this game as the Axis. Played without a bid. A bid may have made a, a minor bit of difference, perhaps, depending on what was put where. But I don't think extra stuff in Russia would have made much difference. They have been absolutely clobbered here. But thanks for watching, folks. As we say here at the Hilltop Pillbox, hug your loved ones. And tell your friends and family that you're so glad they play with you. And until next time, may those dice be with you.